Hello students. We are now covering a an issue in war which has recently come to the forefront. It was not something a lot of people thought about in say the year 2000, uh, the permissibility or the existence of, of torture. But after September 11th and after parts of America's response to September 11th, it became clear that Americans were reconsidering their stance on torture, which before had been pretty much a settled question. Like the, the pretty standard answer was, no, we don't torture. We don't do those kinds of things in America. Then with the new challenge of, uh, of um, international terrorism and the particular way that those groups operate, it really got a lot of people thinking that maybe a different enemy required different tactics. So that's how Luban's article starts out. Um, well, a, a, sorry, a little context first. Um, a little sort of context about how to read this article. So what Luban does here, it's a particular style or strategy of writing. You'll notice he doesn't come right out and say, my uh, main point is that torture is always wrong and I'll prove it using, you know, this, this theory or this, this point. What he does is he says, instead, this is a real question that we have to grapple with today. It's a real problem that we need to solve. Okay, we either need to, we either need to figure out that um, torture will be acceptable under certain circumstances but not others and which kinds of torture we want done in our name as American citizens or we need to figure out, no, it's unacceptable, America doesn't work like that and then make sure that our, um, the CIA and the armed services aren't, aren't doing that without our consent. Right? It's a, it's a big important issue and it needs to be addressed. So he starts out pointing out that there's a current debate over it. And then what he does is he offers up um, a, a series of points that are meant to undermine or reduce support for torture. So he doesn't think that he has proven that torture is always wrong. But what he does think he's shown is that standard ways to justify um, torture under certain circumstances don't really hold up. When you look at them closely, they're basically they're bad or ineffective justifications for torture. So those who want to torture for certain to achieve certain goals have to come up with better reasons, or they're doing something which is uh, has not been justified as morally acceptable, and therefore they're doing something pretty wrong, right? As a general rule, if you can't justify why you do something and there's arguments against it that you don't respond to, then you're doing something morally wrong and your reasons aren't good enough to prove that it's acceptable what you're doing. So what in this particular article, the way that strategy works is that Lubin gives a number of different reasons. There's three main kinds of reasons he gives. Um, why support for torture doesn't is is not really good it's not acceptable okay. the point i'm about to make here though is that each one of those three points he makes are completely different points so what that means is you can find one of those three points compelling and a good reason something you want to think more about but think the other two are weak so you could accept all three, you could reject all three, you could accept the middle one, say, but not accept the other two. So that's just something to notice. There's different styles of writing and there's different styles of making arguments. Some kinds start out with one basic principle or theory and then they sort of steadily apply it and it just sort of moves A, B, C, D, E, F. The things are all related together. Okay. Another way, and this is what Luban does here, is that you present one argument all by itself. The first one is about the, um, the unrealistic nature of the argument. Then you complete that argument, you set it aside, and you move on to a different argument. But since the two aren't connected, like B following upon A, C following upon B, 
you can find what he says about the first one totally right and then find what he says about the second one totally wrong. Or you could, of course, find both correct, but you aren't going to find the second point correct because of something said in the first. They're just not connected that way. So think about it this way. What he's doing is saying something like um, um, he's against the National Football League, right? Okay. And he'd be giving one kind of argument. We'd say they're paid too much money. Uh, it's not fair. There's Americans starving and they're paid too much money. So I'm against that. Okay. And whether you agree with that or disagree with that, you, you understand what that point is. It's a matter of economic justice and uh, equality. Then he might go on to make a second point, totally separate from the first, even though it ends up in the same place. So he might say, also, the amount of concussions that the players suffer uh, is too high. It's too dangerous of a sport. Okay. Now, you see that whether the athletes get paid too much and, you know, they're starving Americans is one kind of point, And that the injuries to those who play it are too dangerous totally separate kinds of argument. One's about the health of the players, their safety. It's basically pro-player. And the other one's almost anti-player, right? That's how different they are in saying those people get paid too much money and there's these other people that don't have anything to live on. One's about money, one's about health. They're just totally separate. And you see how, once more, you could agree with both of those. You could reject both of them. You could accept the first but reject the second one. Or you could reject the first as a bad argument and accept the second one. Because they just sort of float independently. So, part of why I point this out is you just want to know what kind of points you're coming across when you read people's comments online, when you read articles online, when you read for school. Because sometimes it's like a package deal where you basically have to accept or reject the whole point being made. Other times, like Lou Ban, it's not that you pick and choose, but like the economic versus the health point, they're just very different things. One is not sucked up into and reliant upon or dependent upon the other. Part of why I point this out, besides the fact that it, it helps you reading for homework when you, if you can sort out articles like this, was that often someone gives an argument that we think is bad, that doesn't make sense to us, uh, on an issue. And then we'll think because they're more or less wrong or we're not convinced about that point that we disagree with them entirely. Now, some points really are like that, where if you sort of accept what they say about A and B and C, if they add them all together, you really do have to accept D because it's nothing but the result or synthesis of all the points they've made before. That is one kind of logical, political, and ethical argumentation. Another kind, though, is like what we see in Luban, again, that you don't just pick and choose which one sounds good to you, but you can be logical and still accept some of what he says and uh, be logical and reject some of what he says. That is, you can be in part agreement with Luban and you can be in part disagreement with Luban. So to return to a point I've said many times throughout the term, there is no such thing as just being pro and con on any issue. We say that all the time, and we all know what we mean, but nobody's just for the torture of, uh, of terrorists. And even if someone is flatly against it, they, they might describe themselves as con or against torture. There's still a bunch of reasons they give, and the reasons are what matters. And if someone ever gives more than one reason, which they usually do, then you can find yourself in partial agreement with that person, even if you disagree with sort of the outcome. So once more, you could think that torture is acceptable for the United States to perform as an institutional practice in the U.S. That doesn't mean you necessarily disagree 100% with Luban's points. Surely he probably makes some decent points, just like if you're pro-choice, anti-abortionists make some good points. If you're anti-abortion, pro-choice people make some good points about, about legal freedom, etc., Right? Admit that the other side is on to something, even if you disagree with it um, or you don't agree with it 100%. That's my point here. 
Okay. So you're saying, okay, professor, thank you for the <laughs> the meta lesson about how to read ethical arguments and to be nice to our friends even when we disagree with them. All fine and good, but you also want to know about the article. So let's turn to what Luban says. Luban says in the beginning lines, he says, traditionally, you know, for hundreds of years, liberal democracies have said no to torture. They say, our country does not do that. Now, the term here, liberal democracy, doesn't mean liberal like those on the far left. It doesn't mean, you know, socialists or, you know, hippies or anything like that. Here, liberal means people like John Stuart Mill, John Locke, okay? Liberal democracy here means what you and I just mean when we say democracy in a, in a casual conversation. It means freedom of the individual is paramount. It means governments represent the will of the people. That's the democracy part. Liberal here means loving liberty or freedom of individuals. And it always means that there's some reference to basic human rights. So in the U.S., that's more or less our Bill of Rights and some other parts of the Constitution. Where they guarantee, they say, <coughs> excuse me, um, Liberal democracies say that there are certain bedrock principles that no matter what, the government can't do X, Y, Z. Right? The government can't just take your property. Um, the government can't just silence your speech. There always has to be some very specific reason why. So the point here is once countries, the United States, France, the UK, Canada, Australia, right, Germany... Spain, all these countries, once they become, quote, liberal democracies, that is, once they recognize that individuals have freedom and rights that must be respected at all costs, uh, and that the government is empowered by the people, by human beings to do certain things, basically to protect human beings, that there's certain things that the government can't do. It can't tax without representation. It has to give free and fair elections. And, in the background... Oh yeah, it can't torture. Now remember, since democracies only protect the rights of their citizens because they think that all human beings have natural, inalienable, that is, non-violatable rights, what this means is not only that governments in democracies can't torture their own citizens, it means that governments in democracies can't torture anybody. Basically, because there is a bedrock foundation beneath which you are not allowed to go that says every human being is valuable and every human being has rights. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Lots of us will agree with that in general. We'll say even a convicted criminal should be you know, given the death penalty, put to death, but you shouldn't torture the criminal first. Give them a last meal, you know, let them say goodbye to their family. There's certain things we do even for murderers. So a lot of us will say, yeah, there's a, a, a set of rights or a set a, a part of humanity in everyone, even the killer. But then we want to say, well, but we're talking Al-Qaeda here. We're talking ISIS. These aren't just people who, you know, murdered someone in cold blood for money. They kill thousands in our country in a few hours. Then they go to other countries. They behead people. They try to wipe out entire um, ethnic groups like the Yazidis, I believe they're called. ISIS is trying to kill this sort of religious ethnic community, uh, wipe them out. You see, these people aren't just bad people. Bad people, like criminals, still have rights. These aren't even people anymore. Or, different point, but a related point, you might say, even if they're still people, the danger they pose is so risky. They attacked the Pentagon and New York City all in one day, and we're probably trying to get to the White House as well. You say, this, this strikes at the very heart of, uh, of American life and freedom, so 
when pushed into a corner, when the stakes are so high, we have to respond with every tool available. Now, I just want to point it out again, even though these aren't Luban's points. Okay, this is what, what many Americans say. Just want to point out again that you see that those are two different points I just made. One is about the inhumanity of Al-Qaeda, that they don't have the right to be free from torture because they're not really humans with human rights anymore. They're monsters. And then another point is whether they are monsters or not, um, the risk they pose is so high that we have to do anything we can to prevent that risk. Once more, you could agree with one and not the other, reject both, accept both, etc. Just want to show you once more how that kind of thing works. So this is what Luban says. He says, Americans, if you would have asked them in 1980, is torture acceptable? They would have all said, no, it's not acceptable. We don't do that. That's what broken dictatorships in other countries do. We would never do that. That's what people would have said in the 70s, 80s, 2000s, or sorry, the 1990s. Now, this is the question, right? Is Was September 11th a wake-up call that sort of woke us up from our being naive about how the world really works? That there are monsters out there or that there are threats out there that might... Um, require you to really get your hands dirty to, to fight that threat? Or was September 11th something that hurt us and scared us and surprised us so badly that we broke our own moral codes and did things that we would never accept otherwise? That we would never accept when we accept when we're scared, shocked, and hurt. Okay, so the question is whether September 11th really, in fact, changed everything, and if so, why? And I just leave that as sort of an open question for you to think about. Obviously, September 11th was bad, but Pearl Harbor was bad too, and we didn't torture Japanese during World War II. So if there's a difference here, which there, very, there, there are differences for sure. If there's a, a morally relevant difference, what is it and why would it in this case allow for torture when in many other very horrible circumstances we didn't allow torture? Okay, so it, I'm, I'm going to ask two questions here that are, that are sort of related and I'll just roll them together. First one is, as I said, is did September 11th in fact change everything? Did it change the rules for what Americans can and should do, can, cannot and should not do? And always in our class, we want to know why. We don't just want to go with our initial feelings uh, or initial knowledge even, like true knowledge. Yes, it changed everything. No, it didn't. You always want to say why that would be. Give reasons why that would be. Okay. And so part of how I want to follow up to that, still the same first question though, is um, why, if it changed everything, what's so different about, different about this than, say, the Cold War, World War II, uh, Civil War, etc.? All of these are, involve horrible acts. Uh, all of them pre pre present grave dangers to the nation, but we didn't authorize torture in them, so why is this one so different? Okay, the, the second question is a more general one, but to me it relates to if September 11th is different, therefore if it authorizes torture, um, why do other things not authorize torture? So the basic question here now is this. In what circumstances, if any, would you authorize the United States government to use torture? Right? Would you allow them to use torture as a punishment? Um, if you would allow it as punishment, one of the a related question is this, would you allow it to be used on citizens? So would you allow the U.S. government to torture citizens like yourself if they were convicted of a serious enough crime? Would you allow them to torture only non-citizens? Right? So should there be something in more or less our Bill of Rights that prevents us as citizens from being tortured? Um, related to more of what we're going to talk about today, torturing to get information uh, from terrorists to prevent a terrorist attack. Um, in what sort of terrorist-related situations would you allow torture? 
And um, a, a bit like I've asked other questions before, um, what I want here is I want your minimum threshold for torture. The thing which is just bad enough that you'd be willing to torture. Because if you give as your example something like, there's a madman who wants to wipe out the whole entire world, destroy the earth, um, and do so painfully, and da 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 would you torture one person to save them? Okay, a lot of us would say yes. But that's the most extreme situation. I want to know the thing which is the least extreme. Right, because if you'd be willing to torture someone who is, say, convicted of um, uh, child molestation as a punishment, that's a very different stance that you have than that you torture the person who's going to destroy the whole world. Okay. Okay. Um, the flip side to this is if you are one of the people who says no torture ever under any circumstances, then try to express why, even in a very serious situation like, say, a potential terrorist strike. Um, you wouldn't be willing to torture even though there's so much at stake. Okay. So that once more, the basic question here is this. When, if ever, would you authorize the United States to use torture and you want to give your the thing just bad enough that it would authorize torture, not the most bad thing? And if you don't think the United States should ever authorize torture, you have to try to say why, even though there's some pretty serious situations out there that torture might help with, okay? And actually, we'll end this recording here with the context in that question, and we'll have another recording that says specifically what Lou Ban says. Okay, so we'll end this recording here. Thank you, everyone.